All right, I will try to be mindful of the fact that I'm standing between people in the end of the day. So I want to talk about um, a particularly interesting transport problem, which has to do with the behavior of magnetic fields in accretion disks. Now, I know the last speaker said that astrophysicists hate to talk about magnetic fields, but the process of accretion onto stars or collapse objects or black holes, whatever, is one of the um, premier sources in the universe for very high energy photons, very energetic, conspicuous phenomenon, and um, it's run entirely off of magnetic fields. So there's a limit to what we can do. I'm going to talk about work I've done with Amir Jafari um, several years ago, and then we've come back to it recently. And just to give you a sense of what we're talking about here, I stole an image, a radio image off the web of um, a particularly bright radio source. And if you peer at it very carefully, ah, there we go. Um, here's the uh, central compact radio source. And you see a beam coming off to this side with a termination shock. And there's no beam on this side. That's because um, there's a little trick of perspective here. This beam is actually um, headed toward us, and it's strongly Doppler shifted. And this one is headed away from us, and you can't see it, um, but you can see the termination shock. This little thing in the middle is driving a powerfully, um, powerful jet, which is magnetically driven. Um, and this is one of many such objects in the universe. They can be big like this. Um, with a gas going around a black hole of, um, I forget for this one, tens, hundreds of millions of solar masses. Or they can be um, small, relatively speaking, like in our galaxy, maybe 10 solar masses. And this is a, this kind of jet phenomenon is seen even in around protostars. It doesn't have to be a black hole. So, um, the problem we're going to, I'm going to talk about today is the problem of having a geometrically thin disk of material accreting onto some central object. Um, many examples of this. Because of the geometry, it's very unlikely that there's a dynamo that generates poloidal flux, this vertical flux threading the disk. Um, but there appears to be, in many cases, quite a lot of poloidal flux threading the disk anyhow. Um, so, um, we like to believe that somehow this has been accreted from the environment. In terms of total flux, that's not that big a problem. Um, many of these systems have a nearby star that's supplying flux. A supermassive black hole in the center of the galaxy has an influence stretching over broadly enough that the galactic flux that it accretes would be enough to do interesting things. It's also true that this poloidal flux may be an important dynamical variable in the disk. So this is just a cartoon version of an accretion disk with a cutout. Um, and the principal components here, uh, I can barely read that. That's not a good choice of color. Um, anyhow, the disk plasma is collisional. Um, more or less described by an ideal gas equation. Uh, it's described by um, resistive MHD, but actually the resistivity is so small that you could ignore it for most applications. We have some central object. The disk itself um, is usually not self-gravitating. It's the uh, central object that supplies all the gravity in the system. And the gas in the disk is just orbiting around that central object and is confined vertically by the vertical component of the magnetic field. Almost all disks have a hot halo of material, usually outflowing. They have winds that are probably launched magnetically, often very highly ionized material. And they have a jet, not always, but typically. Um, sometimes very powerful. Okay, so um, what's going on here in terms of magnetic fields? The disk 
is probably containing um, a significant toroidal field. That is, the magnetic pressure inside the disk is not a huge fraction of the gas pressure, but something on the order of 1% or 10%. Um, that field, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. Clicked prematurely. Can I go back? Um, Yeah, okay. Um, so the toroidal field is unstable, um, magnetorotational instability. You can think of it as putting a spring in a differentially rotating material. The stuff farther in has less angular momentum, but it's rotating faster. So the magnetic field lines um, that get stretched radially uh, get pulled at different speeds, and angular momentum gets pulled outward, um, and the gas flows inward. Um, that same instability generates a lot of turbulence in the disk, and that turbulence probably, 99%, um, drives a turbulent dynamo in the disk, makes the whole system self-sustaining. The poloidal field is, we presume, accreted from the environment. Oops, and now I've gone backwards. So here's a little cartoon um, of a poloidal field being constricted inward as it gets accreted. And the question is, how realistic is that, and can we build models that describe that? So the simplest answer for why a magnetic field might behave that way is an incorrect one. It appeals to the notion that in a highly conducting plasma, the magnetic field is frozen in to the plasma. So if the plasma moves inward, the magnetic field moves inward, and that's the way it goes. Um, now, that is actually not the truth. The, there's a small resistive term here, and it can be infinitesimal, much smaller than um, V cross B term from fluctuating velocities in magnetic fields. But its curl is locally large, and you get lots of individual places where you get tiny little eddies of magnetic reconnection. The field is chaotic. Um, the field lines undergo Richard, Richardson diffusion as you move down the field lines. They basically diverge at an eddy width for every eddy length they go. And consequently, um, tiny little localized but omnipresent ubiquitous little patches of reconnection mean that from one time to another, downstream along a magnetic field line takes you to a totally different place than it did a short moment ago. And magnetic field lines, by any definition, reconnect constantly so that plasma is not actually tied to magnetic field lines in the presence of turbulence. So if that's not the case, how can we describe it? So this is a cartoon of the next answer. Um, you have the field lines going through the disk, they're bending, here's a turbulent region, and the plasma's flowing inward, dragging on the field lines. But because things are very turbulent, there's also turbulent diffusion, so the radial component here will diffuse over here and match up with this radial component, and that will eliminate the radial field which has the effect of moving the magnetic flux outward. And if you do a short calculation, and this was done now 20 years ago, um, no more, sorry, I'm getting old, 30 years ago, um, what you get is a simple argument indicating that you can't bend the field lines very much at all. Vertical diffusion um, basically keeps the field lines almost perfectly straight. If for a thin disk, so that the height is much less than the radius. The bending angle you get is also of that same order, and field lines do not accrete. Now, that's a simple analytic argument. Um, it was very quickly noticed that it was wrong, not because people thought of the reason why it was wrong, but people do numerical simulations of this situation, 
They're very limited. It's hard, you can't do a stationary simulation of an accretion disk without worrying about how you supply it at large radii. And so people tend to do short time simulations of local dynamics. But in any case, whenever people um, do a simulation of an accretion disk, they find that in fact the magnetic field lines do move inward quite efficiently. So this argument is simple, but also apparently wrong. So how can this be fixed? Um, you can do a quasi-linear calculation in the presence of turbulence. That is, we have um, fluctuating electric field, V cross B. Um, you can ask if we do take um, uh, account of the influence of the magnetic field on the velocity field and an account of the influence of the velocity field on the magnetic field. Um, multiply by correlation time. Uh, you can try to evaluate this quantity and get first order predictions for the turbulent components. What you're looking for is not diffusion, but everything. And that includes, for example, buoyancy. Magnetic field will tend to float up out of the disk. It includes um, velocity pumping because the magnetic field will tend to be pushed down gradients of turbulence. It includes everything um, from every vertical gradient there is. So um, what we do in practice, we take the time derivative of the V cross B, um, look, multiply by an anti-correlation time, look for correlated pieces, and get our prediction. That includes, hopefully, everything. And what we find is, oh, OK, this is not so important. Um, what we find is a complicated expression, but let's just group this here for a second. Um, this is the turbulent pumping term, which depends on gradients of the turbulence. Um, Velocity has the effect of pumping you away from regions of strong turbulence. The magnetic field gradient comes in in the opposite sense. Um, this is the buoyancy term. Magnetized regions tend to rise. But there's a complicated correction because there's a coupling between the fluctuating magnetic field and the background gradient of the magnetic field that affects the pressure. And that gives you a partial cancellation of the buoyant term. And um, what is this? This turns out to be due to the entropy gradient. And again, there's a complicated geometric effect. And in general, the velocity is different from the effect of the velocity has the opposite sign from the magnetic field. Um, these things, which I've just been gesturing at vaguely, are the effect of geometry. Um, these factors, this one, say, r sub um, x squared, is like, you can think of it as the average kx wave number squared divided by the total wave number. So these factors are, are close to 1 if an eddy is flattened along the direction described. And they're close to zero if the eddies are stretched out in those directions. They're shape characteristics, big for flattening and small for stretching. Um, technically, it's an operator, which is the square of the Riesz operator, the Riesz transform. In Fourier space, it's just the uh, product of the unit Fourier vectors, wave vectors. OK, so the net effect is, in an ideal world where the magnetic field fluctuations were in perfect equipartition with the kinetic energy fluctuations and um, the turbulence was isotropic, you would get a very weak drift. Um, basically, you'd be going, pushing the magnetic field towards regions of um, uh, 
smallest, I have to figure out the sign here. You're pushing away from the gradient in the entropy sphere headed toward low entropy regions. Um, in a well-mixed fluid, of course, that's not much of a gradient. Uh, in a disk, that would tend to weakly confine the field. But the magnetorotational instability is highly anisotropic, and it's magnetically dominated. So you'll get closer to the truth if you just ignore the magnetic... Um, did I just skip a slide? No. Um, you'll get closer to the truth if you just ignore the uh, velocity terms. Okay. The other thing, though, is um, you have to do diffusion right. And again, we think of, we think of, I think of magnetic fields as adding an additional diffusive effect from the fluctuations. Um, if you do a simple calculation, you get that diffusion looks like this, where this is the heavy chivoted tensor, and this is the Reynolds tensor, this is the Maxwell tensor, this is a correlation time. Um, this is, in isotropic turbulence, you're adding the magnetic and um, velocity um, energies, kinetic energies, and multiplying by tau to get a diffusion coefficient, and this would be like the current. Um, however, because the magnetic fluctuations couple in a complicated way, this term actually looks like this where this is, I'm sorry, I switched notations. This is also the eddy shape factor. And so mid, it, near the midplane of an accretion disk, for example, where the magnetorotational instability eddies are very flattened vertically, um, this is, whoops, this is just about one. And so the net effect is that, for example, the radial diffusion of the vertical field acts as an anti-diffusion. So it tends to exaggerate. Um, if the magnetic field is concentrated at smaller radii, the net effect is to concentrate it more, contrary to what you'd expect. Um, the other complication here is that uh, there was some discussion of magnetic helicity um, in an earlier talk. Magnetic helicity is a robustly conserved quantity even in the presence of turbulence, it does not get dissipated. If you have, um, if you have a component of um, this thing, which is parallel to the magnetic field, that will tend to deposit magnetic helicity on eddy scales. That creates a back reaction, which tries to shut that off. And so you need to correct this to include the back reaction. That turns out to be complicated, but um, not, it, it doesn't make a qualitative difference in the answer. Anyhow, um, for turbulence driven by the magnetorotational instability, the major vertical effect is in fact buoyancy. You get um, a ratio of the radial field to the um, vertical field, which grows rapidly as you go away from the midplane of the disk, as the pressure falls, you get a power law rise in the radial field, and you can get enormously strong bending angles so that the field lines within a pressure scale height of the midplane of the disk are almost perfectly straight, but then they bend way over. So, in fact, in agreement with what we see in simulations, you can get very efficient compression. It works better for weak fields than for strong fields because stronger fields dominate the dynamics sooner as you go outward from the midplane and cut the process off. So what you expect is that it, the outer edges of the disk, there'll be huge bending angles. The field lines will be nearly flat. Um, this, by the way, helps drive a wind from the magnetocentrifugal effect. Um, even if the gas is cold. And as you go inward, the bending becomes less and less as the field becomes more and more concentrated. Um, so let's just skip ahead a little bit. And what you find is that um, you can do this more effectively for 
high mass accretion rates than for low mass accretion rate systems. Um, in any system, you can imagine if you go to small enough radii and you have some supply of magnetic flux, you'll get to the point where the accreted poloidal flux will dominate everything. It will be a significant fraction of the magnetic pressure. Angular momentum will stop being passed out through this thin disk and just go into this wind, which you know has a much broader angle, doesn't have to go through the narrow disk. And so it has a huge lever arm. And eventually, shortly after you get to that point, the magnetic field will be capable of driving a jet. So you can ask what kind of systems can drive jets. And what you find is that, um, oh, I should correct that slide, so I'll just skip it instead. You get a criterion for the radius at which things become critical, and you can drive um, an outward flow um, of material in a jet or a strong wind or whatever. I haven't worried about the dynamics of the jet. Um, this is the expression. It's, you know, dimensionally, it has to be this. Um, the two-thirds comes from the, um, a little bit of thought about the uh, dynamics. What you find here is that all things being equal, the thing that makes a jet possible is to have a small inner radius. Because, you know, this expression by itself just tells you if you go to a small enough radius, something will happen. But disks don't have infinitely small inner radii. They have an outer radius set by their environment, say the orbit of the binary companion that's donating mass, or the nuclear star cluster in the middle of a galaxy, whatever. Um, and an inner radius set by what kind of object they're accreting onto. So it's a black hole. The inner edge is a few times the Schwarzschild radius of the black hole. If it's white dwarf, it's the radius of the white dwarf plus a little bit. And what you find from that is that um, white dwarfs shouldn't run jets just because the radius of the white dwarf is typically too big. And in fact, they don't. So there's that. Um, and black holes typically should. So um, conclusions. Um, thin disks contrary to simple arguments, can efficiently suck up poloidal fields from their environment. That poloidal field can be supplied by the galactic magnetic field, if we're talking about a supermassive black hole, or they can just, it can just be supplied by a companion star. Um, most accretion disk systems around stellar mass black holes are um, in a binary system where it's another star that's donating the gas. If it weren't there, the black hole wouldn't be accreting anything particularly. Um, and you're going to have interesting, strong magnetic field effects if you have a small inner radius um, or a, uh, um, actually a small, for a given strength of magnetic field, a small accretion rate will also um, help do it. But in general, more probable for black hole systems than for white dwarf systems. Okay, that's it. If you have the poloidal field uh, being created outside the disk, then it should be created by a toroidal current. And where is that toroidal current, and what are the charge carriers in it, and what is sustaining that current? Okay, so um, that depends on the circumstances, but there's sort of two generic answers. One is there's a companion star, and there's a toroidal current in the star, and the charge carriers are electrons, and the process by which it's being generated is some convectively driven turbulent dynamo within the companion star. In the case of um, a supermassive black hole in a disk, it's the galactic dynamo, and um, there 
Well, there are various answers for how that works. But in general, it's still electrons. The source of the turbulence is less clear cut, but we observe that the gas in the interstellar medium is turbulent. Um, and so, since it's a differentially rotating turbulent system, generically, it should have a turbulent dynamo. The galactic magnetic field is something we observe, various diagnostics. Um, and it's got a strength at around where we are of a few times, um, a few microgauss. Um, and the poloidal field is maybe a factor of 10 weaker. Um, down near the center of the galaxy, within the nuclear star cluster, the general environment of the supermassive black hole, it's up near a milligauss with a large poloidal component. Um, I can't, I don't know much about the galactic dynamo, so I should just stop there with the observational results. Can I ask a question? Uh, just a very, very brief question. Uh, when we have stars, probably a relativistic general theory of relativity is relevant. But when you have black core holes and you get closer, closer, and closer, at some stage there would be relativistic corrections. In terms of turbulence, magnetic field, and everything else, what kind of qualitative influence it would have on, on turbulence? It's a good question. Um, so the turbulence has typical velocities which are um, like the sound speed in the disk, which is to say they're smaller than the orbital velocities by the geometric ratio of the disk height, the, the disk height to radius. So for a thin disk, the internal turbulence um, in the frame of the disk is still pretty non-relativistic. It's just what you'd expect. Uh, the answer would be different if the disk becomes fat. But then everything I've said is probably off anyhow, so. Um. All right, thank you, Ethan, again.